Welcome to Kites and Strings, the podcast about creativity. My name is Steve Plume. My co-host, Catherine Shinnock, and I are both registered art therapists and licensed clinical professional counselors, in addition to being creatives. In this podcast, we explore and offer varying perspectives on creativity, and we especially look at the tensions often present for those who choose to live a creative life. Along the way, we interview fabulous guests who have found their own successes living their creative lives. Today, our guest is Jenny Hart, and you're going to hear that I have some history with Jenny as I hung out with her brother in college. But it's been over 30 years since Jenny and I have really spoken. Maybe eight to 10 years ago, I was catching up with Jenny's brother, and I asked him about her. His response? Oh, Jenny, she's an international superstar, and he sent me some links. I learned that she was chosen to be in a select group of artists called 40 Under 40 that were recognized by the Smithsonian on the 40th anniversary of the Smithsonian's Renwick Gallery, where some of her work is still on display. I love that she met with us and shared so much about her family, what inspires her to create, process, the founding of the Art Mafia in Austin, Texas, her company Sublime Stitching, and so much more. We learned, too, that it's from outside a box and outside the influence of structure that allows Jenny to grab her string and fly her kite in its purest form. Prior to hitting record today, Jenny had asked a question about art therapy. She knew that I had pursued art therapy and she was getting some information about my practice and Catherine's practice. And that's where we pick up. Instead of making art in the practice, we're, we're basically reflecting on the art that they make in the world, either, uh, either as like a musician, as an actor. I'm always kind of thinking with my art therapist brain about a person's relationship with their art making, whether it's like a, a professional art making identity or a personal art making identity and how we can tap in mine and explore that. Yeah. yeah. And that's kind of almost how this podcast was yeah. born, to be honest, yeah. because I was thinking too about the idea of getting in touch with that part of yourself that you may have pushed into the corner because it doesn't seem to fit. Like everybody gets into like, I got to make a paycheck. I got to do this. I got to do that. And that part gets pushed aside. And the idea of bringing that back in and embracing that is one of the ideas that yeah. kind of drives this podcast. And that's why the name Kites and String talks about that tension. Oh, oh, between oh I wondered what the title meant. The kite is, is that gregarious arty floating around in the sky. And the string is that thing that kind of keeps it tethered. Mm. and it, it wouldn't work unless there was that tension. You're right, right. So we kind of embrace that idea. Yeah. So. And I, I think that's the big challenge for people who are professional artists is the kite and the string become one. Um, and depending on how you structure your professional identity as an artist, do you have people who do your string work so you can just do your kite work? How do you find the balance of the two? Mm -hmm. um, how do you transition between the two? What happens for you when your, your string work becomes so heavy that you feel like you've lost touch with your kite work? Mm -hmm. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> you been there, I, Jenny? <laughs> oh, yeah. That, that, it's interesting because I think I've kind of managed to put those in neatish little boxes, um, mm -hmm. you know, because for me, you know, I, Steve knew me when I was young and making artwork and working very differently yeah. than I do now. You know, I, I work, I work commercially, you know, I make, I make a decision to do work that's designed to be, you know, my embroidery patterns are, you know, commercially, they're meant to be commercially mm -hmm. available, uh, appealing to a customer. And, and so I work from one perspective when I'm doing that. And, but built in that also are things that I want to, I do, like I do collaborations with artists that are just uh, passion projects. It's just purely what I want to do, even though they're not big sellers or they're not designed to make money. And I think for me, with my art practice, I've always, I've always wanted to not make that my money maker, not try and figure out how I was going to make money off my artwork because I didn't want anything to and this is not to criticize anyone who does work this way. It's just for me personally, I didn't want anything. I didn't want those things to inform the work. Yeah. You yeah. know, that's why I have a degree in French. Um, that's why I did museum <laughs> work. I always wanted something that was going to give me that space to just then work in my studio and not have it be uh, a conversation with a gallery about what they can sell or that just didn't, that didn't appeal to me. And it's, and, and yeah. over the last, 10 years it got 
you know, and I, I moved to LA from Austin, Texas in 2010. Mm -hmm. And I lived in Austin for 11 years. Right. When I came to LA, I kind of had a fresh perspective on, you know, well, what's, what's the art scene like here? And um, was very, very involved with an arts organization called Machine Project and did some wonderful things through them that I wouldn't have done otherwise that had nothing to do with my original practice. And I got farther and farther away from even wanting to talk to anyone about my work until I even got to where I didn't care if I showed my work. <laughs> and my husband started, as my husband saw this happening, he, he said to me, he said, you're the only artist I know who doesn't, has no interest in showing her work and, uh, or selling it. And for the last six years, I've only been working on pieces in my studio. Gosh, saying this makes it sound like, oh, come to me. <laughs> but right, right. I, I have exhibited, but it's been by, you know, if I'm invited or asked, and that's wonderful. So that's become so important to me. I'm interested in making art that is not based out of a conversation necessarily with another person saying, you know, maybe have you thought about doing this or maybe you should go in that direction. For me personally, when I look at art, that's the art that's the most interesting to me. You know, like when I hear, you know, this painting by so-and-so came out of a discussion with their gallerist saying that, you know, it kind of sullies it for me in a way. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I'm like, no, nah, I'm less interested. I want to know what they made for themselves. I want to know what they made and then and then showed it and it was just out there. I worked in a museum. I worked as a preparator, which is, if, if anyone knows what a preparator is, it's really an unglorified and uncertified Sioux paper conservator. And I studied with the paper conservator at the Art Institute of Chicago for a summer. And one of the things that she said, you are preparing the artwork for either display, transport, or storage. And if there's anything that's been done to the work, that is damaging it over time or degrading it or causing it to fall apart, you're trying to undo that. And that can be a very big question, especially if it's something that the artist did to the piece themselves. Yeah, yeah. And somebody asked her, said, so do you think that was a mistake that the artist put this stuff on there that they shouldn't have done it? And she said, there is no, they made a mistake. It's just, that's what they did. That's the piece. And you have to, mm -hmm. that was, that really landed with me where I was like, yeah, that's right. It, it's just, for an expression I don't really like it is it is what it is it's there yeah. here it is for better or for worse because you said a lot there Jenny that I, I think is, is really powerful the most salient thing for me in this moment is like art that's supposed to be timeless and not age everything ages everything evolves everything decays everything dies and so here we are trying to preserve fine art, the most beautiful things in the world. We can't let them, we can't let them be destroyed. Future generations need to see Mona Lisa's smile in its perfect form. And like, oh, fuck yourself, dude. Mona, Mona Lisa is going to get some wrinkles and whatever that means for a painting. Like, this is my personal, like, frustration with the fine art world is it's trying to make things timeless that should not be. Yeah. There's, there was a great art piece. I don't know. This was years ago. I saw it was a huge sign at, a, at an art fair and it said all, all art. And this is an important distinction. Either it was all art is contemporary or all art was contemporary. Yes. If you're trying to strive for something timeless, then you're playing to, then it's still not, then you're still trying to play this game and right, yeah. right. it doesn't need to be timeless. Yeah, I want I want to see yes. something of the time. You know, that's that matters. We we interviewed an artist, Luis Sagoon, and he he talked about it. like some of his stuff was he put it purposely on cardboard right. he picked up off the street, right? Because he was talking to the professors at that point about creating artwork and this art this material was going to last forever, and he felt pressure mm -hmm. by that. And he thought, I don't know if I really want my work to last forever. Let me do right. it on cardboard. Right even if we retain the image as perfect forever, the meaning of that piece is going to change over time. What the Mona Lisa meant when it was made is really different than the, the meaning and the relevance that it has culturally, symbolically now. So the concept is evolving, even if the image itself is static as much as it can be. So I'm not sure how far we got in answering the big questions about other people's art, including the likes of Da Vinci. But Catherine will soon toss a huge question at Jenny regarding her art making. 
We discuss how her family influenced her, and I'm thrilled to revisit my earliest interactions with Jenny. So as someone who is really like not wanting to make for someone else, why why do you make art? Oh, oh. <laughs> <laughs> what's the meaning of life who are you what happens when we die and why do you, <laughs> why make do you art? Make can you just answer those in the next five minutes please you know the answer for me has always been it, that it's it's a compulsion like i can't remember a time in my life i know this is what most artists say i think this is true of anyone i always wanted to sing i always wanted to do this and i always yeah. wanted visual art resonated with me since i was a young child and i was also exposed to a lot of visual art and all different media. My father was a great lover of commercial illustration and he was a photographer. And, you know, being a little girl in the 70s, our house was just full of books. And one of the things that was really wonderful about my parents, and I don't even know that they realize it, is, you know, they were very, very strict, almost, almost to the point of being puritanical about what you watched on TV, about, you know, just almost sheltering. But I, if it was in a book, I could look at it. A book was never taken out of my hands. And so I got exposed to a lot of art, a lot of literature, a lot of very adult subject matter, frankly, because my dad was, he used to get those wonderful Time Life series books. And I used to just lock myself. We had a closet that we called the book closet and I would just pour over them. And a lot of those books, or at least one of them in particular, it's all about uh, photojournalism of the Vietnam War or of the Spanish War, mm -hmm. riots. And so I saw a lot of those really, really famous, very hard to look at photos as a child. You know, Mary Ellen Marks photos of the women in the mental institution. Honestly, it would be very hard for me to justify putting material like that when I think about my nieces in front of them. But at the same time, for me, that all of that exposure had such a net positive in my life. But getting back yeah. to the art that I saw, you know, the way it made me feel, I just always, I wanted to, it was also became an aspirational thing of like, maybe I should be putting something out there that communicates to others the way this communicates to me. I think you tap into something that makes you feel things moves you and that that's what I find inspiring when people will say what inspires you I always feel like it's a question of like what are you what what are what is your work derived from which is not the same thing as what makes you want to make art and for me I find inspiration yeah. mm -hmm. in being emotionally moved so it could have nothing to do you know like yeah. a scene in a movie that inspires mm -hmm. me um, great art great achievements things that I, go, I just kind of take my breath away, make me want to go home and get my hands in, in working. More specifically, I just find working with my hands so gratifying. And, you know, originally I, you know, I worked in painting and drawing and photography. You know, embroidery was not on my radar. It was, yeah. I didn't grow up sewing or embroidering. It was very much of the crafts realm and and when I was a teenager, I was very, you know, snotty about crafting. It was that's something kindergartners did. Um, I wanted to be an artiste with a capital A. Um, and so then the idea of working yes. in embroidery, embroidery became, the thing I tell people, I say for years, embroidery was, um, I'm going to learn Italian one day. Like that looks really interesting, but I'll probably never do it. I probably don't really have what it takes to get into that minutia and that technique. But I just thought, I was like, what if I took, and this is a very specific thing about my work, is that what if I took embroidery, and embroidery is huge, you know, there's Turkish embroidery, there's Indian embroidery, every culture has their own for thousands of years style of embroidery. What if I took embroidery, the kind of American handcraft that you see on tea towels and pillowcases that's done in simple, colorful cottons, what if I did that with serious subject matter, like, or a portrait? Mm -hmm. And that's what got me excited was because I could see in my mind taking that and I thought, what if it were a beautiful portrait? Not on a jacket, not, not as decoration, but as, it's, as the thing itself. And I think yeah. portraiture is, I started doing working in portraits because I wanted a very straightforward subject that would showcase the embroidery. So that it wasn't about, you know, I'm trying to depict some fantastical scene or some theme or whatever. It's a portrait of a person that you recognize. You know what this is, and but you can see the embroidery and see what's happening with that. That's so cool because I, I mean I'm thinking of 
back when I first met you, I think you were, that was probably when you were in your capital A kind of snotty. Oh, I remember exactly. Um, and it, I remember it exactly. I was 14 when we met. Yeah, you were, yeah, you, oh were, you were very young. And um, I think it was not long after that you were getting ready for like a, a one person show that you were involved in or something, which I was like really impressed by. At that point, I was going to school with your brother and in art school and stuff. Remember seeing you just kind of like working so hard on all this stuff. And I thought you were pretty cool. I thought kid. you were pretty cool too, Steve. Yeah. <laughs> Oh, I did. Thank you. Oh, I did. Love fast, love fast. <laughs> so then I thought, wow, what, what drive? And a, I, I'm thinking of your family, and you, you gave a little bit of the history and your, your dad and all that type of stuff, and just remember thinking your family was so steeped mm. in the arts. So I mean, and I knew Scott, and he was an incredible illustrator and just somebody that could just do amazing work like that, and and so expressive and fun, and and um, and then you had an another brother who. All I can remember is he in the Quad Cities there. He was sort of your Sven of Swalik. Sven of Swalik. What? I'm messing up the name. Sanguli. Son of Son Son of Svenguli. There we go. Son of Svenguli. <laughs> in the Quad yes. Cities. That's right, Tom. He had a show. So yes, correct. I have two brothers. My oldest brother is Tom. Scott is the next oldest. I'm the baby. Uh, Tom. Tom was always into writing and acting. And in the Quad Cities, the first Fox Channel affiliate, he was the host of, without the makeup and the, you know, the horror aspect, he was this host when they would do like the Saturday night movie. Yeah, yeah. And so he was always doing like little bumpers between, like the commercial break would end and he would do like skits and talk about the film. And people got so mad. They kept calling into the station saying, we just want to see the movie take this guy out of the whole thing the station said, we'll just give you a solid half hour to do whatever you want. So for like, <laughs> like seven years, he had a show called Live on Tape that he wrote, directed, starred in, and all, and he was very into the acting scene there. So these are all local actors and he did a comedy show for years. Uh, and he now, and then he moved out to LA before, long wow. before I did. Um, and he's a very successful Emmy nominated uh, writer for children's animation for Disney. So cool. And Scott has always been this uncanny talent of imagination and fascination. And uh, yeah, he can just draw like crazy. And the thing that I think, um, you know, whenever I talk about the influence that my parents had, I always want to, I always want to explain, you know, I think it, I always figure people imagine they must've been like these wonderful bohemian hippies. And it's like, Oh no, they were, they were actually much older. My parents had me late in life. They were silent generation. My dad was Nebraska, raised as a Nebraska farmer. My mom's from rural Arkansas. And so the fact that they made all these artistic resources so available and, and encouraged it was really unusual. It was unusual. And I think um, it was in DeKalb. I was 14. I was making uh, collages. like Yes, crazy. yes, yes. And I was very into my family's history because I didn't know anything about it. Both my parents are only children. I don't have aunts or uncles or any first cousins. And I was growing up oh, in a farming town that was all about extended families. Yeah. So I felt very disconnected from my community because I didn't have a gang of cousins that was going to come get you if you took my lunch money, you know, that sort of thing. So I stayed in my, yeah, <laughs> yeah so I stayed in my room. That gang of cousins. Yeah. So that was later, Steve. I had, I had, uh, I had my first solo show with a local art gallery when I was 17. And then I had a solo show with theater in Chicago. I'm embarrassed. I can't remember the name of it. And yeah, so that's, that's where it was. I remember having dinner at your apartment. Oh, really? It was, it was me and Scott and a group of your friends. Cause we all went out to a party that night. Yeah. Yeah. I think I, re I remember anyway, that. Yeah. I remember that. I was staying with Scott for a couple of days. Right. In his, in that little studio apartment with his yeah. crazy stuff. And I remember this, we're going down memory lane. I love he it. He would like tell your parents, like, I got a big critique coming up and he would get some extra money for supplies. And then he, oh, would, uh -huh. then he would spend the weekend buying Chinese food and pot and just get high <laughs> for uh, the course, entire yes. weekend. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. We're going to do some talking about parenting. And Jenny's going to reference the work of American photographer W. Eugene Smith and his photograph, Tomoka Yamira in her bath. I couldn't recall the image when she mentioned it, but after seeing it, I recall it from an art history class I took decades ago. It's really powerful, 
We'll put a link to a site where you can see it in the description of this episode. You know, talking about your family, Jenny, one of the things that really stands out to me that it sounds like it wasn't necessarily intentional on your parents' part, but with having all these books and with you as a child being exposed to very um, evocative imagery, evocative narrative, and, and that your parents didn't try and like hide, shield, or protect you from things that might evoke an emotional response or an uncomfortable response. I think so often parents try to protect their children from anything uncomfortable and it creates this inhibition. Um, and for you, it really, really sounds like it's something that helped you connect in emotionally as well as like creatively and wanting to communicate and share messages. And I, I think we can learn from yeah, that. I, I totally agree. I don't think they, you know, if my mom were to listen to this, she'd say, well, I didn't know you were looking at that stuff. And honestly... <laughs> I think, I think it's so hard for parents to know what children are really paying attention to. I think of this all the time with my nieces where I'm like, you know, they're listening to everything we're saying, you know, what are they seeing that's really landing with them? There's a very, very famous photo of a, a woman bathing her daughter and her daughter has, I believe her daughter has, she has uh, cerebral palsy, very famous photo holding her in her arm. She's giving her a bath. A lot of the children that I grew up with in the 70s had undiagnosed learning disabilities. One of my best, was the friend that I played with down the street um, had a learning yeah. disability and it was a totally different time. And I don't know how this would affect a child today, but it did, it made me more understanding. You know, it was hard to be confronted with. It was very upsetting to see that photo. You don't want to traumatize a child, but you also don't want to make them so coddled and comfortable that when they are confronted with simple realities of the world, that they find those things traumatizing. Yeah, you don't know what to do with that. That's that right, that's right. I think as, as adults, if we can be available to children to help them contextualize and understand things that may be uncomfortable and they see that we as adults aren't afraid of it, it makes it not traumatizing. But like if our traumatic response or our fear response to something shows up as either overprotective right. or like, <laughs> here's some crazy shit, look at it, kid. That Both of those are, right. are wrong. <laughs> It's being present for the kid and letting, a, letting them know it's okay and that you can have some questions about it. And I'm here to offer whatever guidance I can. If that's you right. Totally. Totally. And I think not knowing is scarier than knowing. So if you have a child that's like, I don't know, I can't look at that. I don't know what that is. That's what you imagine something worse than Way once, worse. once the curtain is right. drawn. Well, then it goes back into that taboo corner of the, of the mm -hmm. brain, right? You stick it somewhere back there and it becomes this unknown thing that it becomes mm -hmm. scarier and therefore must be avoided at all times as opposed to known and understood. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, integrated into your, your narrative and understanding of the world. We're going to focus more on Jenny's art now. We'll discuss size, tactile qualities, working on a piece for three years, and we'll explore how she, unlike many previous guests, strays from the idea of needing a box or structure for doing her art because she does not want to be tied to anybody else's ideas. Also, early on in Kites and Strings, we discussed how important it is for people to find their medium, and I'd love to hear Jenny talk about being surprised by her choice as I could say the same thing when thinking about how much I enjoy the detail work of futzing over the audio and editing of this podcast. In short, when seeking your creative outlet, be sure to pull every string. You might be surprised. Finally, in this section, we're going to learn about how Jenny has pushed the envelope with her company, Sublime Stitching, because we were all getting pretty tired of geese and bunnies. I was just going to go back to your art for a second, Jenny, just to kind of visualize this. When I think of embroidery, I think of like a little, you know, needlepoint hoop or embroidery hoop that's maybe, I don't know, maybe pushing it 12 inches in diameter. And it's very nice. And it's like the size of a nice couch pillow. What is the size of your work, Jenny? <laughs> 
I have a, well, I have a piece that's about nine feet across. <laughs> that's embroidery. That's embroidery. It's not, it's not super dense embroidery, but um, right, right. I do pieces that are like four feet by four feet. Some people like working with deadlines. I don't with my artwork. It's, it's a total disaster. I started clearing my table as it were of deadlines, which takes a really, really long time to do. And then started saying yeah. no to everything. And that was so I could work open-ended on these pieces. And so I have a piece right now that I've been, I've been working on for about three years, building it up and building it up, using different techniques and working extremely dense and extremely fine in some areas and working really broad and really big in others. I really like using techniques that are traditional craft techniques. I like trying to work in silks and very what's called thread painting, where you're just working really solidly. So yeah, I don't know if I answered your question, but you you totally did. And and I, I wanted to ask you that specifically because I caught myself envisioning like embroidery and having to remind myself that embroidery as you do it is massive. And I think there's something about manipulating size in work with material that that moves it again in different ways. Sure. If, you know, for me too, I like working on fabric. I love the tactile aspect of it. Working on it's very comforting. It's like sitting there, I have a blanket in my lap. The sounds it makes. The other yes. thing I like about it is that it, you can fold it. <laughs> I know this sounds silly. I love the fact that I can take this piece and fold it and fold it again and I have this neat stack. And the larger pieces, when I send them to be exhibited, I have really specific installation instructions. They have buttonholes mm -hmm. at the top so that they can be hung on hooks. And I send them measurements for how far apart the hooks have to be so that it will drape a certain way. Yeah. You know, it's like this is not supposed to be stretched. It's not supposed to be fixed. It's totally fine if it's near a vent and it gets blown a little bit. I ask them, I say, would you please consider putting an extra sign that says that you can't touch this? Even though people know they're not supposed to touch art. And I don't, I kind of like this because it's a sympathetic thing about the piece is that people feel at liberty and they want to touch embroidery. They want to touch the fabric. They want to see what the back of it looks like. And, and I've even done, I, I've done a piece, this is a long time ago. I did a, a pillow and I did a message in French knots in Braille. And the whole point of the piece is that you can't touch it. Oh. I know it looks like a pillow and a pillow is supposed to be used for comfort and to touch. And the only way you can decipher Braille is through touch. But this is this piece is art. You can't touch it. <laughs> so I like I like playing I like playing with that. I love it. Yeah. And this is just a quote from a review from one of your from one of your books that you put up. And somebody had wrote, if you're looking for Aunt Martha style transfers, this probably isn't for you. But the tattoo design on the cover should give that away. <laughs> what a juxtaposition. This is embroidery. But they look like sailor tattoos. And, and, yeah. and I just always thought that to be such a, a cool contrast. And I, I loved how you talked about opening up the piece and having it revealed to you as you open it up again and, and the sound that goes along with it. But it also seems to be like such a deliberate medium, right? You're there and, and really focusing on very specific parts at a time. There's no big brush stroking. Yeah, totally. That's actually what kept me from doing it for such a long time was I thought I'd never, I was like, I'm too wired. I'm too, I don't like to sit still. I wanted, I, I'm very impatient. One of the things that always appealed to me about drawings are drawings that look like are beautiful and effortless. And I'm just like, oh, it just flows out of your pencil. You know, it's like, no. You agonize over every line is what's actually happening. And so when I started embroidering, the slowness of it, I thought it would test my patience. What I didn't know was that it actually instilled calm yeah. in me and I needed that. And seeing this line and these forms form so slowly is very mesmerizing. I like that about it. I like that and I had a newfound appreciation for other embroidery because now I looked at things that I looked at before, flea markets for pennies, for a doll. I'm like, somebody spent hours and hours. It was a joy for them to do it, but there's so much thought went into this. And something I've started doing with these bigger pieces is I really like doing quick sketches. Like I have a chalk pencil and I work on a lot of black linen and then I'll embroider it because the embroidery is slow. And so I like the idea of embroidering over mm. something that was drawn quick and messy, and yeah. but now the technique to actually render it was something that took time. I love that idea of taking something that you, you did real quick as a, a sketch, but then really painstakingly looked at every little nuance of those lines. 
when I started designing patterns. So sublime stitching, yeah, that was the whole idea of, you know, this is where it comes to the commercial and design platform. That's what those patterns are. These are a design platform for someone else who wants the enjoyment of embroidering, but maybe they don't feel comfortable drawing or they just, you know, I like embroidering other people's patterns and designs and illustrations. Mm -hmm. The last renaissance of hand embroidery had been in the 70s and it had just devolved into you know geese and bonnets and these kind of sappy bunnies and Mm -hmm. and i just started thinking the companies that manufacture these patterns aren't recontemporizing it anymore Mm -hmm. and they're giving embroidery a bad name because people are equating these patterns that weren't commercially appealing except to a very small group and was not inspiring or interesting to somebody who was younger so to me, that was just such an obvious thing to do. It was like uh, shocking, you know, tattoo design for embroidery. It was totally shocking. Mm-hmm. And that was what really launched the company was that I was doing these, you know, what were considered just completely disparate images. Through my education of embroidery and its history, what I love is going back and when I see, you know, maybe something from the turn of the last century, a woman's activity magazine, and it will say, you know, the latest in modern embroidery design. I, I, I just consider myself part of a long tradition of recontemporizing embroidery because it happens again and again and again, where they go, it, and there's just endless things that you can do with it. It sounds like you thought the powers that be were kind of just writing it off. Yeah, there really wasn't, first of all, separate from cross-stitch. I mean, cross-stitch is a form of embroidery, but just free embroidery just is such a niche and such a small aspect of the industry that when you have large companies that design, you know, thousands of craft products and, you know, nobody was making a living as an independent embroidery designer. I mean, to call yourself an embroidery designer or to be an embroidery artist just It didn't exist. It wasn't a career. It wasn't a thing, period. And so I was really an outsider. You know, I wasn't going to go to a craft corporation and say, would you look at my work? We now had the internet and I could put up a website and put my work out in front of people. Jenny's love of embroidery really gained steam when she lived in Austin. In addition to sublime stitching, we're going to hear about how she was influential in the very beginnings of the craft mafia movement. Google craft mafia and you will see that since that first craft mafia in Austin, many have followed suit. Check it out because there might be one in your city. And if not, start your own. I think in Austin you created the, the what was it, the Austin Craft Mafia, or you were part of that uh, There group? were three of us that started it, and it became a group of, I think there were eight of us, um, became the core group, yeah. Which is very cool. So I'm guessing that's sort of around the time that this was mm-hmm, happening? Mm-hmm. Yeah, that was, right. that was really, um, how that came about was I had my idea for Sublime Stitching, and I started seeing who else was working in handcrafts, and it was, it was a very active community online, and there was a woman named Tina Sparkles, she was doing really interesting stuff, making guitar, cute guitar strap. And then, and she lived in Austin. So I wrote her and I said, Hey, do you want to have coffee? I'd love to meet you and tell you these ideas I have. And she said, sure. Can I bring my friend Jennifer, who was Jennifer Perkins of Naughty Secretary Club? So the three of us met at Flight Path Coffee in Austin. Anybody who's from Austin knows where that is. And for a couple hours, talked about our business ideas and talked about the magazines we liked. And we said, you know, if we pulled our money together, we could afford a print ad. And And then that really blossomed into the Austin Craft Mafia. And then it became an official group. And then it became a network for anyone who wanted to start their own craft mafia in their city. I love this. I want to start a craft mafia. (laughs) Yeah, you can. And and we had a website that, you know, it's like, if you want to start a craft mafia, there was very little, we, we just wanted to be able to provide people information through our hub of if there was one in your city, know who the person was organizing it. And so the, our craft mafia doesn't function as such anymore, but there are still craft mafias out there that do. I love it when I hear about them. It's There's really- the One near my, my son's, one of his previous apartments in Montreal. And I remember they did a number of uh, sweater bombings, mm-hmm. which is way cool. Do you know what those are, Catherine? Have you heard? Oh, no. it's where people, like you'll walk outside and you'll see somebody have gone, they'll go and put a, a sweater around a tree. I've seen bicycles sweater bombed. and I Yes, I've seen this. I have seen poles or trees covered in sweaters. Moving forward, we're going to hear about how selling a piece to Carrie Fisher led to a string of sales to some of Hollywood's greats and an Elizabeth Taylor story that you will love. 
I, I read a story somewhere. I think Carrie Fisher saw one of your pieces and really grabbed onto it. And then from there, it seemed they became quite the hot numbers. It was crazy. For years, I had three pieces of national or international print press for a month for years. It was just constant. And it was really intense and really stressful at times because what happened was, is I had, um, uh, I was with a wonderful gallery in Austin called Yard Dog, uh, Yard Dog Gallery, still there, Randy Franklin. Um, and he focuses on folk and outsider art. And though I am not an outsider artist, he really felt that there really wasn't a home for my artwork. And we both felt that his was the best place. And um, so I had my first solo show of my embroidery work there and it sold out. And also my work was getting published in magazines. You know, all of a sudden everyone wanted to commission me to do embroidery, but it takes so much time to do. Um, and that was actually how Carrie Fisher found my work is that she visited the gallery. She bought one of my pieces and then she started commissioning me. I did work for Debbie Reynolds. I did work for Elizabeth Taylor. I did work for her husband. I did work for Tracy Allman. Oh, I'm name dropping it. So gross. <laughs> no judgment. <laughs> she was, she was wonderful. She was, she was, she and I were in direct communication for a period of time. My first trip to LA, I contacted her. I said, I'm, I'm coming to Los Angeles if you'd like to meet. And she said, that would be great. Why don't you come to the house? And so I spent an afternoon and an evening with her at her house. And she took me to Elizabeth Taylor's home. Oh my God. <laughs> and it was, and, and I did not get to meet Elizabeth Taylor, but she was home. It was just crazy. And wait, wait, wait. You and Carrie were just wandering around Elizabeth's house yeah, and she was Yeah. Okay. Um, I would I would like to say that in my visual of you and Carrie Fisher wandering around Elizabeth Taylor's home, she's got Princess Leia buns and you're both coated in diamond. <laughs> Actually I was wearing a white mink stole. <laughs> Perfect. Uh, with like a you know a t shirt underneath it and ripped blue jeans. That, that's just what I'm gonna stick with as my story. What what was what was happening was she wanted me to make a portrait of her dog for a birthday present, but she didn't want to spoil the surprise and she needed to get a photo of the dog. She said, "Let's just go over to the house. Let's just go over there and we'll get." It. So we jumped in the car, drove to Bel Air. <laughs> we go up to the gate and she buzzes the gate and she says, "It's Carrie." And they said, oh, okay, come on up. And she looked at me and she said, they don't let anybody in. <laughs> I was like, <laughs> and we go up to the house and, you know, she, she was talking with her assistants and while she was talking and trying to, and telling them what we were doing and trying to get this photo, you know, they explained, they're like, she's, she's up in her room. She doesn't really feel very well. So she won't be coming down. So that's fine. And so while she was talking to them, I was just left to my own devices. And so I just, just wandered through the house and. Did you walk out Oscar with like and... a fork? Oh, an Oscar. <laughs> you know, your coat is like full of all just little like knickknacks. <laughs> I will admit the whole time I was there, I was like, I, this is so terrible. You're like, I have to have a souvenir, but it can't mean anything to anyone except for me. And so I took a tissue from a tissue box. I love it. <laughs> I love it. I'm so, I, Jenny, I would have been really like concerned and disappointed if you didn't take something from Elizabeth Taylor's house. And where is this tissue? But, but it can't be, it can't be theft. No, it can't be theft. Um, where is this tissue now? It's, it's, it, it is somewhere. Um, I have a photo. I asked to use the bathroom, which I'm sure I did need to do. And I took a photo of myself on the toilet. Perfect. So that's, that's the only other real souvenir Bravo. I'm like. It's like me. I have a look on my face of like, I don't know what's going on. I was like, that's, that's so me. Funny. I pissed in Elizabeth <laughs> Taylor's toilet. <laughs> Claim to fame. But yeah, it was really, it was hard, you know, Steve. It, it just, the work blew up. People just responded so strongly to it. And so I was, you know, trying to do my artwork and also trying to start a company yeah. for which there was no model. Yeah. And and I loved it and it was also incredibly incredibly difficult. Those were just in, incredibly intense years because I was also dealing with a lot of a lot of tragedy in my family. You know, my dad was very very sick. I was in I was in an abusive relationship and my mother-in-law passed away from brain cancer wow. and this all was happening at the same time. Yeah. I it was really hard. You know, there were times when I was like I don't even know if I'm enjoying this. I feel like I'm just on this runaway horse and hanging on for dear life. And sublime stitching for me really was the only thing in my life that I felt I had control over and made me happy. And it wasn't happy because I had, I thought I had control over it. It was the people responding to it. It was my customers. Mm -hmm. And that's something I really want 
people to know, and especially my customers to know that they kept me sane and kept me and sustained me. And they still do. When my dad was sick, I was staying with him in the hospital in Conway, Arkansas, and I was using the computer in the hospital library to answer customer emails. And so to get customers writing me saying, I, I got these patterns, they made me so happy. I just To get a nice email from a stranger at that time was absolutely sustaining to me. I had no one else that was supporting me emotionally. And I got that from the people that were responding to Sublime Stitching. And I still get that today. That, that is what kept me hanging on to those nice. reins of that crazy horse that just everything was just nuts, nuts. And for a long time, many, many years. I'm guessing during that time where you were getting all this request to do all this stuff, it pulled you away from that kind of the timeline mentality. If you were getting commissions, there was now structure being put upon you. I was really grateful to have the commissions because I needed the money. So, you know, it's that was the per- period in my life where I did tons of portraits by commission because I needed the work. But it became frustrating because people more yeah. and more, yeah. they're looking at what you've already done and they're like, ooh, do that again. I love what you just did. Will you do that again for me? And it's like, actually, I want to go on to the next yeah. thing. So do you think that that has driven where you're at now, what you were talking about earlier, about just wanting to make art? Yes, totally. And it's, I love it. It feels great. Love it. But I'm sure with Sublime in that world, there's deadlines. Yes, but they're self-imposed. Okay. You know, I love the structure. I love running my business. This is kind of maybe a weird, you know, usually artists, you know, I know this is kind of a generalization of like, you know, well, I don't like, you know, to deal with, you know, balance sheets and But it's a form of creativity. Yeah, it is. I find it fascinating. I find running a business and trying to cobble together a business really challenging and really interesting and incredibly rewarding. And I went from where I said yes to everything for, I don't know, 15 years. And now I say no to basically everything because I want zero deadlines. The only deadlines I have are ones that I impose on myself. It is the greatest freedom. I love it. I've worked really, really hard to get to this point. I'm so grateful. You know, I was talking to my husband about this the other day. He's like, don't you think it's incredible that your business has sustained through all of these? And I said, yeah. And I said, but the thing is, is that I never, ever considered giving up. There was always this carrot, this thing in front of me. I'm like, no, I want to do that. Okay, this is great, but I'm going to get to that point. Okay, now I'm going to get to that point. And mm-hmm. I think what drives that is maybe the, the past successes and being sustained by that. That's exciting and invigorating. And then I go, okay, now I want to go do the next thing. And just being inspired by the medium and embroidery itself. What I hear, Jenny, is your kite's always been flying <laughs> and that you enjoy all aspects of it. The thing that really stands out to me in all of this, even when you talk about the period of having to do a lot of commissions, nothing has sounded pressured, Mm. even though commissions are not the work that you're generating for yourself. That is a direct, I am generating work for someone else. I really get the sense from you that your kite is always flying and that sometimes someone else is giving you the string. Sometimes you are holding the string where you're at now is you're like, my kite's just going to go wherever the fuck I want it. And I'm holding the (laughs) string and thank you very much. So I really like, I appreciate that about you. Thank you. You're welcome. That's nice. I it's I really love how, you know, I wondered why you called the podcast Kites and Strings. And now that you've explained it, it makes perfect sense. And uh, yeah. my mom sent me a box. She's been moving out of a house in Arkansas and she had saved all these press clippings. And Steve, these were a lot of local newspaper articles from when I was, you know, younger and doing artwork and showing them to my husband. And he said, Well, you're an overachiever. And I was I was really kind of offended. I was like, I was like, I'm not an overachiever, you know, because to me, I think of an overachiever, someone going like, I want to do these things for the point of doing them and for proving to other people I can do it. And I've never felt that way. I just, I just was like, oh, I I have to do the thing. Time is short. I've got work to do. I don't want to be sidelined with stuff that I think is not important. And then at the same time, I'm always trying to like weigh like, well, is what I want to do important? Is it, or am I being selfish? Is this ego driven or is it actually, you know? And so these past few years are the first that have felt calm in a really long time, even though there's still a lot of, you know, I'm still working with a lot of intensity, but I don't have the same anxiety that I used to of wondering if my business was stable, if I was going to have to find a different job in several years, regardless of, you know, the efforts I put into it. Well, it sounds like it's gotten into a pattern. Mm-hmm. Sublime. It's a lot yeah. of stuff is figured out. Yeah. You know, I've, I, this is the first, yeah. it's taken yeah. almost 20 years can to figure out things that work, things that don't work. I've also. I just used a pun. Oh, I, I missed I'm it. Sorry. Oh, 
<laughs> wait, 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 say it again. Wait a minute. Wait a Come minute. On, no, no, say no. It again. Hold Go on. Back. Hold on. I just wanna. I wanna acknowledge that Jenny, you and I both missed Steve's bad pun dad joke and he couldn't let it lie he had to he had to come back and be like but but guys guys did you hear it i made a bad I joke a thing. wait i did a thing there <laughs> wait don't tell us i want to hear it when i listen to the podcast I, yeah, so that, don't do it again this is, okay this is the gem of the podcast <laughs> and and your moment in it my dumb pun. You, it's not your dumb pun it's your need to circle back to it <laughs> you just said something clever so, <laughs> so any anyone listening to this podcast who caught Steve's pun the first time around, will you please send him an email and be like, don't worry, bro. I, I got you. I got you. I got you. <laughs> oh my God. It, is, it is so cool that it has gotten to that place. It took a lot of work to get there. You were just doing your artwork and you were doing some cool things. And this isn't the work of an overachiever, the type A, I got to be on those headlines. It's that you're doing good work and people recognize it. Therefore, headlines just seem to follow. Yeah. That's a, a great place to have arrived. And it's fun because it's also afforded you the opportunity to now just sit and do art because damn it, you want to do art and you want to do what comes That's out right, of you. That's right, damn it. I just want to do the thing. And the the funny thing is, is that I've become addicted to knitting in the last year. Oops. Uh, I just took up knitting. <laughs> did you really? At night in front of the TV. I don't need to snack. I don't want to snack. I shouldn't be snacking. So I'm working on a guitar strap oh, right now. That's a good idea. I'm so mad at myself because I became addicted to knitting. I say all this facetiously. I got addicted to knitting. It's the biggest waste of time. My business is only supporting my knitting habit. It's expensive. <laughs> It's so calming, but my husband's just like, you could have done so much embroidery in this time. <laughs> and every now and then I'll stop my wife. I'll, in fact, I've paused the show and said, watch this. Look how fast I'm going. I'm like a machine. <laughs> and then I'll also, <laughs> I also, I like this little click I get yeah. when I, because I'm using the bamboo and it's like, that's a very satisfying click. Yes. It feels great. And, and I, I, you know, I'll dump it in my husband's lap and he'll be like, what? I'm like, you know, squish it. Come on, touch it. And he's like, all right. Okay. And then, and then he'll ask me a question. And then we, we usually say knitting talk. Is this knitting talk? We're having, okay, there's your knitting talk. <laughs> I'm going to leave that for the two of you. Can't handle knitting. I have dabbled in embroidery. What I do with it though, is I use it to embellish paintings. I just add a little dip to it, add a little pizzazz, and then I'm out. There's no way I could work on a painting for three years. Oh, that's awesome. That's, <laughs> but that's so awesome. Yeah. I want to say, I mean, this has been really a lot of fun talking to you, Jenny. It's been so fun to, to visit and learn about the sublime and peeing on Elizabeth's toilet. I peed in it, not on it. <laughs> Jenny pisses in Elizabeth Taylor's toilet might be what this one is called. I don't know. <laughs> well, thanks, Steve. This has been, I, I was thrilled to hear from you again, and I've really been looking forward to talking to you because I, we haven't talked since, the, it's been 30 years, and... Right, right. A couple little things back and forth. Me so too. I'm glad to, to have done yeah. this. We'll keep nice to meet sure. you, Catherine. You too, Jenny. Yes. But so, so anyways, okay. we'll get images and we'll get pictures. We'll put up and, and stuff like that. And thanks for coming Thank on. you. Yeah. Anytime. So. Anytime. Let me know what you need. And if you want to come back and talk embroidery again, I'd be happy to. I would love it. Thank All you, right. Jenny. Thank you, guys. All right. Love you. Bye. Bye. You guys. Bye. Bye. It was so much fun catching up with Jenny. And I love the hilarious thread she spun regarding her first LA visit. Sorry, I, I know I pushed the limit with that one. Anyways, please check out thesublimestitching.com and jennyhart.net so you can get a better sense of the coolness that Jenny brings into our world. And remember that our website is www.kitesandstrings.com. Please share Kites and Strings with your friends and rate us because it really helps. And also, feel free to drop an idea, suggestion, or comment via email at kitesandstringspodcast at gmail.com. You can also find us on Facebook and Instagram. The Kites and Strings theme song is by Harrison Amir, and other original music is by Purple Planet Music at purpleplanet.com. Today's episode was produced and edited by me, Steve Plume, at Turning Stones Counseling, Inc. Be safe.